might search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you know. There's nothing better than you know. There's nothing. Nothing is better. Than you know. 
If any word can best describe this past year, I believe the word would be uncertainty. That's one of the reasons this past year has been so difficult, not knowing from day to day what's coming next. It's caused fear and anxiety and frustration. The events of the past year have also caused us to think about future events that will take place, more specifically, the end times. On the news and on the internet, people are talking about things like the end of the world, the apocalypse, Armageddon, the mark of the beast, and so much more. And these events can be scary and confusing if we're not careful to look at them through a biblical lens. For the past six weeks now, we've tried to look at these real future events in a way that is safe, biblically accurate, and with the hope that you're not only informed, but you are also transformed. And if you've missed any of these messages, I would encourage you to go back and watch them online. They're available on our website. Now, let's look one more time at this end times timeline that we've been working off of for the past few weeks. First, there will be an event called the rapture of the church, where believers in Jesus Christ will meet Him in the air and go to heaven to be with Him. After that, there's a seven-year period of judgment called the tribulation, where we'll see the rise of the Antichrist. There will be devastation. It will be a time of judgment on the world. At the end of that time, we will see the second coming of Jesus Christ, where Jesus literally and physically comes to the earth, and He sets up a 1,000-year kingdom called the Millennial Kingdom. And today we're going to talk about an event called the Great White Throne Judgment, the final judgment we see in the end times, which will lead us into eternity future, the new heaven and the new earth, and eternity with Jesus Christ. If you'll remember last week, we discussed the millennium or the millennial kingdom, where Jesus literally and physically rules the earth for a thousand years as king. We said there would be universal justice and peace, incredible prosperity, and his rule will be characterized by health and healing. And we said at the end of the thousand years, Satan would be let loose one last time, and he will try to deceive the people of the world. He will gather a great rebellion against Jesus, but it will be over with a flash of fire from heaven. Then Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire, fully and completely defeated for all time. And after this happens, the Bible says there will be one final judgment. Now, before we talk about this final judgment, I want to remind you about two other judgments that take place before the final judgment happens. This is a review from earlier weeks, but it is my hope that this helps give us a clear understanding of what's happening. If you'll remember from week two, we talked about the judgment seat of Christ. We see this in 2 Corinthians 5.10. And this is a special judgment that God will hold for believers in Jesus after the rapture. The judgment seat of Christ is not meant to punish believers, but rather to reward them for their faithful service, for expanding the kingdom of God. All of us will give an account to Jesus for what we have done after accepting Jesus as our Savior. And the Bible mentions five crowns that will be given as rewards for our faithful service. We see one called the crown of life in Revelation 2.10. This is for the people who stand strong in times of persecution and suffering and temptation. The Bible talks about the incorruptible crown in 1 Corinthians 9. These are for believers that live a life of discipline and self-control. We see the crown of glory in 1 Peter 5. For believers who lead with integrity and with love and compassion. The crown of rejoicing in 1 Thessalonians 2. For believers who tell about Jesus and help people grow in their faith. And the crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy 4. For people who give their lives to Jesus and follow Him passionately. Here's what I love though. The Bible says that believers will give our crowns back to Jesus as an act of devotion and of worship. I don't know about you, but I don't want to end up empty-handed. 
Because of all Jesus has done for me in my life, I want to earn crowns that I can cast at his feet. I want to earn rewards that I can give back to him as an act of love and worship. There was another judgment we talked about, the separation of the sheep and the goats. And we saw that in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. This judgment happens at the end of the tribulation when Jesus separates believers from the unbelievers and only the believers survive to live into his millennial kingdom. And then John writes about one final judgment. We see it in the book of Revelation and we call it the great white throne judgment or the final judgment. I want to read it to you in Revelation 20 starting in verse 11. John wrote, And I saw a great white throne, and the one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead. And death and the grave gave up their dead. And all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. You see, this final judgment will take place after the 1,000 year rule of Christ. And after Satan is removed from the earth. The Bible says that during this judgment, Jesus will be the judge. Jesus will be the one sitting on the great white throne. Acts 10, 42 says, And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all, the living and the dead. You see, this right to act as judge over the universe is something that God the Father has given to the Son. It is a responsibility, it is an authority that Jesus has from God. John 5 says it this way, The Father has life in Himself, and He has granted the same life-giving power to His Son. And He has given Him authority to judge everyone because He is the Son of Man. Jesus will be the judge at this judgment. We also know from the Scriptures that at this judgment, the unbelievers will be judged. We know this from Revelation 20 and from Romans chapter 2. And unbelievers, people who do not believe in Jesus Christ, those that have rejected Jesus Christ, they'll be judged for their sin. They'll be judged for their careless words. And they'll be judged for the secret sins in their hearts. You see, it's clear that all unbelievers will stand before Jesus at this judgment. And many scholars agree that there will be degrees of punishment because the scriptures say they will be judged by what they had done. For unbelievers, every wrong deed will be remembered and taken into account. In fact, the Bible says in Matthew that every careless word that was spoken will be judged. Even the secrets in people's hearts will be revealed and made public. We also know that at the great white throne judgment, demons or rebellious angels will be judged. We see this in Jude chapter 6. And I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. If you'll remember, demons are angels who rebelled against God. They were cast down to earth when they chose to follow Satan. And the Bible says that they will be judged by Jesus for rejecting God, for rebelling against Him. 
and for choosing to follow the enemy. We also know from 1 Corinthians that believers in Jesus Christ will help in the work of judgment. Listen to what Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 2. Don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world? And since you are going to judge the world, can't you decide even among these little things among yourselves? Don't you realize that we will judge angels? So you surely should be able to resolve ordinary disputes in this life. You see, the believers in the Corinthian church were taking their legal disputes to secular courts that were led by unbelievers rather than handling matters themselves. Basically, Paul was saying, y'all have got to get it together. You better figure out how to judge these small things because one day you're going to be given the authority to judge things that really matter. This is rather an amazing part of New Testament teaching that believers will take part in this judgment. Frankly, we don't know what that means. We don't really understand it. Some scholars believe that believers in Jesus will be watching this judgment and approving of it. Some scholars believe that we will be given the authority to participate in it. But all scholars that I've read agree that believers in Jesus will watch this judgment as it happens. Which is one of the reasons why I believe it is important to remember that the Bible says He will wipe away every tear from their eyes after this judgment. I do believe that we're going to see this happen. And I believe that we're going to know people at this judgment. And I believe that we may even cry out in compassion for friends and family members that we know and love that didn't accept Jesus Christ. Because the unbelievers who face this judgment are ultimately destined for a very real place called hell. Now, let's spend some time here for a moment. Because when we approach the theology of hell, we have to do so humbly. I never want to teach on hell from a position of arrogance or moral superiority. Because we are talking about the real destination, the eternal destination of real people, real people that we know. I don't know about you, but I have personally lost friends who didn't know Jesus and my heart breaks for them. Because we have to remember that heaven is not our default destination. No one goes to heaven automatically. Unless our sin problem is resolved, the only place we will go is our true default destination, and that is hell. And unfortunately, there are three incorrect assumptions about hell that people are believing right now. Some people believe in universalism, that all people will ultimately be saved, but the Bible doesn't teach that. Jesus made salvation available to everyone. But we have to personally choose and decide to follow Jesus with our lives. Some people believe in annihilationism. That people will be punished for a time and then will just cease to exist. But that's not what the Bible teaches either. Or some people, some people believe that we are experiencing hell on earth right now. And although the earth is broken... What's happening in this world doesn't match what the Bible says hell will be like. The reality is, is that hell is a real place of eternal conscious punishment for the wicked. It exists for God to deal righteously with Satan. It exists for God to deal righteously with unbelievers. And the Bible says that it is a place of unspeakable Suffering. The Bible describes it as 
and unquenchable fire in Mark 9 and Luke 16. His intense, unsatisfied thirst in Luke 16. A place where people will remember what their life was like and they will have remorse for the things that they have done. A place of misery and pain. A place of frustration and anger. And a place of eternal separation from God. Now I've heard people say before, and maybe you're even thinking now, I don't see how a loving God could send someone to hell. We have to remember that our God is far more holy than we could ever understand, and we are far more sinful than we could ever understand. And God's understanding of justice far exceeds our understanding of justice. But we have to ultimately remember that God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. Listen to what 2 Peter 3, 9 says. This means that contrary to man's perspective, the Lord is not late with His promise to return as some measure lateness, but rather His delay simply reveals His loving patience towards you. Because God does not want any to perish but all to come to repentance. You see, the heart of God is He does not want people to die and go to hell. He is patient with us. He is loving towards us. He is compassionate towards us because He wants people to come to His Son, Jesus. I know messages like this today, they're hard. They are hard to teach because this is a reality of something that is to come, something that we don't want anyone to experience. So my question is, how do we respond? How do we respond to this great white throne judgment? How do we respond to the reality of hell? Listen, if you were a believer in Jesus Christ, there are four things I want you to do. First, ask God to see people how He sees people. We have to stop looking at people through a lens of bias. We have to stop looking at people through a lens of judgment. And we have to understand that since we have been forgiven, God calls us to love. God calls us to compassion. And God calls us to forgive. Oh God, may I see people as you see people. Number two, I would encourage you, share your God story with others. There are people that you know in your life And they need to hear what God has done for you. They need to hear how Jesus has changed you. How Jesus has transformed you. They need to know that there is good news. They need to know that there is a loving Savior that wants to rescue them from sin. And rescue them from hell. Share your God story with people. And if you don't know how, let us know. We would love to share that with you. We would love to help you. To be able to give your testimony of what God's done in your life. Number three, invite people to come to church with you. Listen, every single Sunday we're going to tell people about Jesus. Whether it's online, whether it's on TV, whether it's one of our in-person services. We are always going to tell people about the grace of Jesus Christ. About our Savior who has rescued us and changed us and has given us a second chance. Invite people to come with you. Many studies show that 85% of people who were personally asked to come to church will do it. But they're not looking for an ad on social media. They're looking for a friend with the compassion to say, Hey, do you want to come to church with me this Sunday? Invite someone. And always, always, number four, point people to Jesus. Point them to Jesus. Because a moment with Jesus can change everything. Now, maybe you're watching and you aren't a believer in Jesus. If you've never made the decision to follow Him, please listen. You need to make the decision to follow Jesus today, right now, in this moment. Because everything that we've talked about, it is real. It is going to happen. And we want you to live an abundant life. We want you to live a God-first life. 
We want you to be everything that God has called and created you to be. And that starts with following Jesus. You see, I know. I know the things that we have talked about today, they are difficult. I know talking about hell, it can be scary. But listen, God in His great love for you, while you and I were still sinners, while we were rejecting God, while we were being disobedient to God, God said, I love you so much. I'm going to send my son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life. And he is going to die on a cross. He is going to suffer punishment. He is going to suffer the wrath of God to be your substitute. Jesus is going to die so that you can live. Jesus died on the cross. He spilt his blood so that you and I could be forgiven and be set free from our sin. But he did not stay dead. And three days later, the Bible says he rose from the grave in victory over sin, in victory over the enemy, in victory over death. And if we will choose to place our faith in him, to trust him with our eternity, to follow him with our life, Lives. The Bible says that He will forgive us of our sin. He will wash us as white as snow. He will rescue us from hell. And you can live an abundant life on this earth. Do you need a second chance today? Do you need a fresh start today? Listen, it all starts with Jesus. And if that's you, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me this morning. You can pray, God, I've been doing life by myself. I've been trying to live my life my own way. I've been trying to be my own boss. God, I've been trying to be my own God. And today I realize I am a sinner that is separated from you. And God, I need your forgiveness. I believe your son Jesus died on a cross for me. And I believe he rose again from the grave. And today I choose to follow him with my life. God, would you forgive me? Would you change me? Would you give me my fresh start today. Jesus, you are my Lord and I want to follow you for the rest of my life. And Jesus, it is in your name I pray. Amen. Listen, if that was you, I want to congratulate you. The Bible says that all of heaven is celebrating the decision that you made. And we celebrate along with you. But please, please don't turn this video off. Do not change the channel without letting us know. You can go to our website and fill out the digital connect card. Give us a name, an email address, a phone number, just some way to reach out. Because I want to pray for you by name. And I want to send you resources that will help you grow in your faith and become more like Jesus. Now, at the end of every service, we dedicate time to prayer because I know you're going through tough stuff. I know you may be dealing with doubts. You may be dealing with hurts. You may be dealing with health issues or financial issues. I get it. And you may be saying right now, Jason, I just need somebody to pray for me. I want you to know we are praying for you right now. And if you want to let us know your prayer request, you can send in a prayer card online. You can email us. You can post in the comments below if you're on our online campus. And our prayer team will be calling out your name to Jesus. So here's what we want to do. Let's worship together one last time today. And as we worship, let's pray. And I want you to know that we love you and we are for you. And Jesus loves you and he is for you. And if you need prayer, you let us know. Let's pray together. In great are you. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you. Jesus, we love you so much and we thank you. We thank you that even though our default destination is hell, Jesus, you stepped out of heaven. You lived a perfect life. You sacrificed yourself in our place. 
so that we would not have to experience hell, so that we would not have to experience punishment. No, we can experience eternal life with you. We can experience abundant life with you, Jesus. Father, I pray. I pray for all those that can hear the sound of my voice today. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would just meet them right where they're at. And God, other, whatever doubt, whatever hurt, whatever health issue, whatever financial issue, whatever relationship issue, God, whatever they're going through, Father, I pray that you would just show yourself strong in their situation. And God, if people need to reach out for help, Lord, I pray that you would give them just a confidence, Lord, to reach out and ask for help today. Lord Jesus, we love you, and we're going to give you the honor and glory for what you do. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.